Good morning. Welcome to Faith Christian Church. Good morning, everyone online. Would you please stand and worship with us? We stand and lift up our hands. What a joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. Can we see? Sing your praises. 
Good morning. Welcome to Faith Christian Church. Good to see all of you uh, here today. My name is Wes. I'm the pastor here. Uh, and I hope that you are uh, accustomed to lifting the Lord's name on high and, and elevating him. What did he say about himself? He said, if I'm lifted up, what will I do? I'll draw all people to myself for healing, for forgiveness, for new life in him. And that is what we hope to do by our worship here uh, this morning. The only announcement uh, I've got, we can look, we can look at uh, yesterday. Yesterday was a busy day. Early in the morning, the uh, ladies gathered and had a, a very nice breakfast here. Thank you to, for everybody who came and, and contributed to that. Uh, last night, we had our HFC annual celebration. Good to see faces from around New England and actually some from Haiti, too, uh, who, were, who were piped in uh, through Zoom. It was very nice to see everybody there and hear uh, a little bit about what's going on around the around the association. Uh, the only other thing that's coming up, I guess the only thing I should say about today is that we're going to have communion today. Uh, so if you uh, if you didn't get your communion elements, be sure during the next couple of songs to go uh, to go get the, your your communion elements. Uh, we practice open communion. That means you don't have to be a member or anything here uh, to partake with us. Uh, just just please be feel welcome to take communion with us. Uh, the only other thing is that we are making a cookbook, all right? So uh, we're making a church cookbook, and Dixie, why don't you raise your hand? This is Dixie over here. She's sort of the, the ramrod of the whole operation. There are a few other people involved in it, too. Uh, but be sure to check your boxes back here, uh, your mailboxes. And if you don't have a mailbox, um, there will probably, I think there's some on the, on the welcome desk out there, too, that tell you a little bit about what we're looking for, a little bit about what the project is. Or just come talk to Dixie, and uh, she'll tell you everything you need to know about it, okay? All right, I think that's about everything that needs to be announced. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll get back into worship. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for this day. We thank you for, um, I thank you for the congregation, for your people, Lord, that we're not all just walking alone with you, Lord. We're not just Lone Ranger Christians, Lord. We're, we're a family. We're a, a team. We're a group of people. We're your church. We are the gathering of Christ followers. And I pray that you'll help us uh, this morning to you know, sort of even feed off of each other's worship, encourage each other, um, give each other confidence to keep walking with you uh, in, 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 if in difficult circumstances or difficult days. Lord, help us to make a joyful noise this morning and bring, uh, lift your name high and bring each other up as well. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, please stand and worship with us song is about any battles that you're going through, and I, I know I'm not very good, but I'm trying to give your heart to God and let him help you uh, any battle that you have, and just try to remember that. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is the mountain, you see a mountain. And as I 
I walk through the shadow Your love surrounds me There's nothing to fear now For I am safe with you So when I fight I fight on my knees With my hands lifted high Oh God, the battle belongs to you Every fear I lay at your feet And I sing through the light Oh God, the battle belongs to you And if for me and be against me for Jesus there's nothing impossible
sound beautiful. Please bring your tithes and offerings forward.
ultimately, that is Jesus. That is Jesus. He, Jesus is God in the flesh. And people walk beside Jesus all the time in the marketplace, having no idea the God of the universe just brushed their shoulder. He was that approachable. He was so approachable, people came to him, fell at his feet, and begged something from him. A word from him, a healing from him, forgiveness from him. He is the tangible, the tangible thing that we've always wanted. Okay? Now for us, he's ascended. We don't have the tangible, the tangible him anymore, but we long for that. We certainly long for that. And I don't know, have you ever clung to a cross because you needed something tangible? Have you ever clung to your Bible because you needed something tangible? Every once in a while, he gives us something tangible. We, we don't worship a piece of wood like that, and we don't worship a book. We, we worship him. But when he who is not tangible to us now needs to be tangible, every once in a while, he'll give us something to sort of feel with our flesh, that tangible thing. And I kind of think about that, a communion like that. He knows that we need something tangible, a tangible reminder, something that's physical, something that's not just spiritual, something that's physical to remind us of his presence with us. And that's kind of what this is going to, 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 to me to be this morning. There are so many layers of the meaning of us taking communion. Today I want to sort of think of it as when he who is not tangible to me uh, is far away, but I need something tangible. Here I've got something tangible to give me faith in the one who is invisible. How about that? Okay. Let's take open our, our wafer here. Mark chapter 14 says, While they were eating, Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we wish that your body was here so that we could give you a hug, so that we could fall at your feet and, and, and even kiss your feet, wash your feet. Instead, we will take the tangible reminder this morning. Lord, remind us continually of your presence with us through these little gifts like this. In Jesus' name. This is the body of Christ. Take it and break it. The body of Christ, broken for you. Let's eat to, in communion with God and each other. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and, when, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the, that day, when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have held nothing back from us, not even your own blood, not even your own life, so that we may have life. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Let's drink together in communion with God and each other. And we ask you to come soon, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit to breathe life into us moment by moment and day by day. We need to keep trusting in you and do what is right in your eyes. We come before you to fix our eyes on your promises and feast our, on your faithfulness. We give you the reins of our life so you can direct our lives. We know your plan for our lives is perfect and true. Help us to put away all distractions of our daily lives, 
Quiet our minds and hearts. Teach us to wait patiently and peacefully for your timing. There are so many uncertainties during this time. May your presence completely fill us with peace and knowing that you have it all under control. Lord Jesus, we pray for our neighbors within this community to feel a nudge to want to know you for the amazing, all-knowing God you are. We pray for our hearts and minds to overcome the fear and unknowing of sharing our testimony of who you are and what you have done for each of us. We ask you to guide us in your timing and discussions with people. We thank you for the fellowship opportunities we've had this week to connect in the HFC annual celebration, open mic night, and women's breakfast. We pray for the new sermon series starting today, Encounters. We pray for your Holy Spirit to be pouring into Wes as he preaches on the biblical people and their first encounters with you. We thank you for Pastor West and his dedication to this congregation and doing the good works for you. We pray for people impacted by the war in Ukraine. We pray for the healing of Ruth Brown and Kay Shea. We pray for guidance for the people looking for housing, jobs, and salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. We're starting this new sermon series today, and I think it's all important for all of us to have sort of a personal encounter uh, with the Lord. Uh, you know, faith can sometimes be a heritage or a habit or uh, a um, just a discipline or or an intellectual pursuit. But what it really needs, the, the, the what I really hope for all of us is that it becomes a very personal encounter. It's not just an ethical system, and it's not just things to think about, and it's not just um, some sort of anchor for our culture or anything like that. Uh, really, when it comes down to it, it's you and your walk with God. And it's us and our walk with God together, but I really uh, hope that every one of us can have our own real sort of personal encounter with God. Now, I've never gone up onto a mountain and saw a burning bush or anything like that, um, but I, I feel like I have had, I have had uh, times in prayer, times contemplating when I absolutely knew that God was with me. Uh, times that when I, I absolutely knew that he was giving me this instruction, this mission to do. This is your maybe calling in life as, as a pastor, or when I was a missionary before, that was a very clear calling that I felt. Um, but there have been other times when it was just a nudge of a whole, the Holy Spirit to go and talk to somebody. And I either did it or I didn't, okay? Because it's not like I've uh, always responded to God uh, exactly the way I should have when I should have. Uh, but I have known there have been times when I knew the Lord is, shh, 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 go do that, go do that, go talk to that person, bring this up, go ask that question, go do, you know, do something. And in those moments, I really uh, definitely feel the, the presence of, of God in my life. Now for this sermon series, uh, I haven't mapped it out entirely, and uh, it is so hard to pare down, uh, you know, w what do I want to do? Do I want to just preach on this for the next 20 weeks or so? Uh, maybe, maybe that would be a little bit exhausting for everybody, but if there were about um, six or seven uh, individuals that I could pare it down to. And there are certain ones that I know exactly that I'm going to do. There are others that it's like, maybe I should trade out this one for that one. Maybe I should, I don't know. I don't know what I should do. Uh, so you can pray for me as I, as I decide uh, who, who gets a sermon and who doesn't. Who gets a sermon now and who gets a sermon later? How about that? But I don't even know, in my whole career, am I going to be able to preach uh, about everything and everybody and every passage in the Bible? I doubt it. I doubt it. Um, but uh, certainly I hope to to preach about the big encounters that people really had uh, w with, with God. Um, so today I'm going to be talking mostly about Adam, but you can't talk about Adam without talking about Eve too. So it'll be a little bit about Adam, a little bit about Eve. Uh, and in this sermon, I'm not really going to be talking about the fall of man, okay? So you would assume that if somebody's preaching about Adam and Eve, the, the garden and the apple and the snake and all that, that's got to that's gotta be included in there somewhere. And of course, I'm going to touch on it just a little bit, but I'm actually not going to uh, talk about it very much because um, actually I feel like it, when you read the Bible the 
the mission that God had for Adam and Eve didn't change after the fall. He gave them the mission before the fall. This is what you're supposed to do. This is how you're supposed to live. And then the fall happens, and God didn't say, well, forget all that, scratch it all, I got a new thing now. If you, if you, if you, since you've done this, the, the mission is different. No, actually the mission didn't change for them. And I think that that's fascinating. I think the mission got harder for them after the fall. In fact, it got uh, almost impossible for them after the fall. Maybe impossible, it got impossible, not almost, but it got impossible for them after the fall. About uh, five different snares or hangups or entanglements uh, were added to it after the fall. But the mission itself really didn't change. It really didn't change. So, please, break out your Bible. Break out your Bible. And turn to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. In your pew Bible, actually turn to page 2. Page 2 in your pew Bible. Genesis chapter 1. And I'm actually going to start reading in verse 26. In verse 26. And, and then we're going to read uh, basically all of chapter 2. There are a few, there are a few little verses I, I may skip because they're, they're about rivers, not about people. But um, Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 26. And Lord, please be our teacher this morning. Whatever, whatever is said from the pulpit, Lord, you are the teacher. Uh, it's your story. You tell it to each of us uh, Point out whatever it is that each of us needs to hear from this passage of Scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the, in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. And that word subdue there, it's very interesting. And a lot of different translations will, will translate it different ways, uh, but mostly subdue. But do you know what it is in Hebrew? You probably don't know very many Hebrew words, but some of you may have heard this word. Have you ever heard, put the kibosh on something? It's kibosh. Fill the earth and kibosh it. Kibosh it. And so when we say put the kibosh on it, most of the time it means stop that entirely, destroy that, uh, you know, but it really doesn't mean that. It just sort of means have dominion over it, have control over it, okay? Put the kibosh on it. It's, it's so fascinating to me. You, we actually uh, know, you probably actually know more Greek and Hebrew than you know, if, especially if you've been in church for a long time. You actually probably know more than you, than you think you do. All right, anyway, uh, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And, so, and it was so. And God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, he rested from all the, of the work of creating that he had done. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when, when they were created, when the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. Now, I want to pause there for just a second. Um, there are two creation stories in the Bible, and one of them is uh, chapter 1, and the other one is chapter 2. And they're very interesting, and they absolutely go right together, um, but they, they teach a couple of different things, okay? Uh, in, in the first chapter, it's, it's order out of chaos and how to define the world around you. And he's also, remember, Moses is giving this to the children of Israel. Uh, he's actually helping, using this to build a culture. And so he gives them the rhythm of life in this. Six days you labor, and on the seventh day you rest. You have to rest. Even, a, even after six God, days, God took a rest. You ought to take a rest too. Now, here's something else that I've said several times uh, from the pulpit. Uh, the chapter and verses, the chapter and verses, the little numbers, the big numbers and the little numbers here, those are not divinely inspired. All of the word of God is divinely inspired, but the little chapters, the big numbers and the little numbers, those are not always, those are not divinely inspired, and I think that they sometimes put them in the wrong place, okay? So to me, very interesting. Look at, 
look at uh, chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array, and the seventh day God rested. Now, does that really go with chapter 2, or does that really go with chapter 1, where he's talking about the seven days of creation? That should go with the first one, right? And then look at verse 4. This is the, the account of the heavens and earth and when they were created. Now, doesn't that sound like the, the second creation story? So really, verse 4 of chapter 2, I think, ought to be verse 1 of chapter 2. You see what I'm getting at there? And so why would there even be two creation stories? But look at, remember, Moses is writing this. And Moses is not the first person to know all of these things. All the elders of Israel, they know all these stories. They know all about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the Tower of Babel and Noah. Everybody knows all of these things. But when Moses and the, the children of Israel are wandering in the desert, he's not just saying, you know, we ought to write that down. And he's not the person that's, that says, you know what, I got an idea. Let's write it down. I, I've got a great story to tell. No, they all knew this. Why would they write it down? They're building a people and a culture. And remember, they're also trying to, uh, what, what would you say, drive out, push out all the paganism that's in people's minds and set them up to where they worship the one God. Because they've been living among Canaanites and among Egyptians for a long time, and they all have their creation myths where a whole bunch of gods did a whole bunch of things, but the elders of Israel, of Israel and Moses in particular, and Aaron, they want to make sure that, no, 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 our people will always be tempted to worship a whole bunch of other gods. We know that because they did. But also, he says, we need to inculcate them with the worship of the one God and why that is and where that comes from. And so all of this story that we know, the creation and Adam and Eve and Abraham and all of the, everything we need to know, that they need to know in order to stay worshiping the one God, we will write that down so that generation after generation after generation they will know it. Okay? And so when it comes to chapter 2, when it comes to chapter 2, he's not talking to them about ordering the world according to your understanding. And he's not even really talking about the rhythms of life either. He's talking about sort of this second most important thing, and that is the home, the husband and wife, the mom and the dad, the male and the female. He's saying, this is how family, this is how we as a people, this is how people got started. This is how we as a people, and we will pattern our families after this design. It's absolutely wonderful. Let's keep reading. Chapter 2, starting in verse 4 again. This is, and so, so put another creation, you know, sort of turn the page and say, okay, this is a second way of thinking about how God created us, okay? Not so much about the dirt and the, the sky and the, the clouds and the heavens and the stars and the moon. Not so much. This is how God created us. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. No shrub had yet appeared on the earth and no plant had sprung, uh, sprung up, yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all the all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of, of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden, and there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second is the, the Gihon. It winds uh, through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east, the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock and all the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. But I want you to hear some sadness here. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. 
So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the space, the place with, the, with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is the first words in the whole Bible of a, of a human being, okay? This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no... How should you understand that word, shame, there? Most of the time when we understand the word shame, it's because we've done something bad. I feel shame because I've done something bad. Uh, but is that how we should understand it right here? I don't think so. This is what I think. This, this, to me, this is the, the better way to tr probably translate the idea of everything that's going on there. They felt no embarrassment, self-consciousness, insecurity. And a lot of people would say, well, of course they wouldn't. Their bodies were perfect. Nah. Even if you got a good body, guess what? You still, still feel insecure when you're naked. It doesn't matter what they look like. They may not have been very attractive at all. They had the genes for all the human race inside of them. They might have looked quite strange. But were they insecure about it? No. And I think they were beautiful. I'm sure they were absolutely beautiful, stunning people. But still, what is it that brought the shame that they didn't have? Why didn't they have that insecurity? That's a wonderful, wonderful thing to think about. All right, now let me ask you a question. What's your earliest memory? What's your earliest memory? How old do you think you were? Does anybody think you, you remember, you remember your first day of kindergarten? Anybody? Yeah? No? Some of you do? Okay. Do you remember things before that? Anybody remember the day of their birth? All right. It was dark. And then all of a sudden, it got cold and really bright all of a sudden. I was screaming. And then they hit me on the bottom and jabbed me with some sharp things. What a traumatic thing to be born. I'm so glad we don't remember any of it. I was there for all three of my children's birth. They didn't enjoy it at all. All right? Um, and the, the, the treatment they got suctioning out everything. Goodness gracious. What a terrible thing to have to go through. All right. For me, my earliest memory, I think I was probably three or four years old, and I was in the little town of Avant, Oklahoma, and I know that because I was at my aunt and uncle's house, and I was standing, and they had a sort of a circle drive, and my dad, my uncle, Wayne, and my cousin Zane were riding horses away from me, and I wanted to go with them, and that's my earliest memory. It really wasn't bad. It, it was probably bad for me. I'm sure I was uh, crying about it. But the fact is, they took me riding with them all the time. Okay? But I'm certain what they, were, what they had done, I'm certain, uh, they had probably ridden me around the yard for a little bit and everything and then handed me off, and then they went off to the hills and the woods and all this stuff, places where a three-year-old probably doesn't need to be go, uh, need to go riding a horse, or at least it wouldn't be very enjoyable if you're trying to, it, you, you know, what's your priority, stay on the horse or take care of the kid, you know, something like that. And I told my, da my, my dad that one time, he said, well, you, you probably, if you just said something, we probably would have taken you uh, with me, and but I know that they did. They always took me with them. It, it wasn't very long after that when I had my pony. Yes, I grew up spoiled rotten with a pony. Even his name was Fred, uh, and I didn't have to do anything. I just sit on Fred, and Fred would just follow everywhere else the other horses went, uh, and we had a great time. I, I I rode with them many many times, but I just remember it, it really still did make a, a does sometimes make an impact in you because. Um, I, at that point, you know, as that little kid, I can't do everything that everybody else can do. I can't do everything that everybody else can do. My, uh, and I was the youngest uh, cousin anyway, so uh, I was left out a little bit there as a kid. And I remember thinking, my dad and my uncles, they can do everything. I know because they tell me to stand on the side while they do everything. Even my cousin, he's just a couple of years older than me, he could do absolutely anything. Absolutely anything. They were all really my, uh, my heroes. So I don't know about you. What was that memory for you? Has it made a deep impression on you? I mean, is it something that you can say, that early memory actually did affect me for the rest of my life? Maybe it's a good memory. Maybe that earliest memory is a very good memory for you. Maybe it's a very bad memory. Maybe it's something very traumatic 
that happened to you? I don't know. Has it affected you? Did it affect you for a long time? Does it still affect you? And then I just want you to think of Adam for a moment. His first memory, after opening his eyes, for the very first time, was as a self-aware adult. He doesn't remember his first day of kindergarten. He was never a kid. He was never a small person. Can you imagine that? Having, never, having not had a childhood. Very strange. You know, the joke we make about Adam and Eve often is that they didn't have belly buttons, right? Okay? But there was a lot of things they didn't have. They didn't have those little childhood memories. Of course, they, and they didn't have childhood friends either, <laughs> didn't they? Because they're the only ones around. But the first thing that Adam was ever aware of, listen to this. Isn't this a wonderful idea? God's smiling face. Now, how do you think that that should affect you? Don't you think that that should set you on a, a great path in life? And when Adam was created, he was unique. He was one of a kind. God even made it very clear to him by bringing all the animals to him so that he could name them. And yet, to be so unique, don't you want to be unique? You don't want to be just like anybody else. Adam was actually not very satisfied in his uniqueness. He looked around and he said, there's nobody like me. There's nobody like me. But that didn't make him feel all that special. It made him feel extremely lonely. He found no kinship with anyone or anything else. And so uh, God taught him that lesson. You need somebody. And it's a very interesting lesson that God would teach because don't we always think and, 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 and believe that God should be enough for me? God should be all that I ever need. I shouldn't need anything or anybody else except for God, except that uh, God, for Adam, created Eve. It's not good for you to be alone. For all the believers in the Old Testament, all the, the followers in the Old the nation of Israel, God didn't just have, okay, here's you, Abraham, you're the only one, you're the only one I need. No, he said, I'm going to make you uh, plural, stars in the sky. I'm going to make, I'm going to multiply you in a family. And in the in the New Testament, does God say, all right, all you need is me. You've even got the indwelling of the Holy Spirit now. All you need is me, all right? So just you, you go out there and make a difference, right? No, he says, I'm establishing the church for all of you. Very interesting. But oftentimes, I think it's our Americanness that we want to go it alone, do it alone. We don't need anybody else. We're the Lone Ranger. But even the Lone Ranger had Tonto. He didn't, apparently he didn't get much praise. But he, he wasn't lone, the Lone Ranger wasn't lone, okay? You understand that? And there's a reason they, that he's called the Lone Ranger. I won't get into it because it's Western. But anyway, um, yeah, it's not good for you to be alone. God never intended for you to be alone. And so God created Eve. He created Eve. Adam was created intentionally, created to be different from other things, and he and Eve were created last, as if everything was done for them. And Jesus, talking about heaven, what does he say about heaven? He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and when it's finished, I'm going to come back for you. God does all of these things for Adam and Eve. They didn't have a part in creation. It was done for them, and they were created to manage it, and not to destroy it, not to dominate it, but also not to be dominated by it. And so much of nature can be dom cannot be not dominated by people, but to the extent we can, we're, we're called to be good stewards of this planet. And Adam and Eve were created in two parts, too. I don't know if you noticed this or not. They were created in two parts. What were the two parts? They are created body and soul. Body and soul, all right? And body and soul. Body was created from the dust of the earth, and soul is... Uh, what is that? It's that breath of life that God breathed into them and that image of him that he put in them. And it's a very interesting thing that he created us that way. So Adam and Eve are, are both self-aware. They see God. They see God as their creator. They see that God created them. They didn't create themselves. And that he created them from, interestingly, very humble parts and very also dignified and holy parts as well. So uh, what does that tell me about myself? What does that tell us about our, our, ourselves? You are made of two parts, 
body and soul, your material part and your non-material part. And so uh, this, is, this is what it says to me about myself. I, I tend to, I tend to, maybe, you, maybe you're the opposite of me, but I tend to start to think too much of myself sometimes, right? I start to get too big for my britches and not just from eating too much. I start to get the big head, all right? And then every once in a while I will, I will be reminded I am merely dust. I am merely dust. God created me from very simple and humble parts. I am not made of steel. I am not made of gold. I'm just made of dust. And actually, back in biology class, I remember uh, one of the teachers telling us how much uh, the, if you took a human body and, and, and split it all into its different elements, how much would those elements be worth? Did your teacher ever do that with you? I remember uh, them saying how much it was worth, but I forgot. Uh, and so I looked it up this week. And I came up with a couple of different numbers, all right? Your parts, the, the, all the elements that you are made of, all the elements and minerals that you are made of, uh, are either worth $5, $160, or $600, okay? Uh, that is what the, a human, the, the, the material part of a human life can kind of be separated into and boiled down to, all right? And any of those prices are still very low for how I would uh, consider my life, for how valuable I would consider my life to be. So anytime I get a little too big for my britches, anytime I start to get the big head, guess what? I can sort of be uh, humbled by the Lord just saying, reminding me, why don't you go read Genesis chapter 2 and remember what you're created from. You're created from the dust of the earth. But anytime I start to get really too hard on myself, every time I start to feel like dirt, any time that I, I feel like I'm not worth anything, guess what God also reminds me of? He says, you are made of more than just dirt, more than just dust, more than just natural elements. There is a supernatural part of you that makes you valuable. The soul and the image of God in you gives you unparalleled dignity. The fact is, we are very different from the rest of the animals on the earth. God has given us a dignity that um, no other animal has. We may look, think of ourselves as animals. Sometimes we've got a lot in common with, with animals. But the fact is, we are created in God's image. And that gives us this very high dignity. This dignity that is extremely, um, extremely, of, of extremely high value. And your value to God is so high that he sent his son to die for you. That value doesn't come from your natural part. It comes from your supernatural part. When God is redeeming a, a human life, it's because he's trying to save the supernatural part of you, not just the natural part of you. And the value of that supernatural part comes from being made in his image. And think of it. Other things that are supernatural don't have that value either. When he sent his son to die, it wasn't for the fallen angels, or it wasn't for demons or the devil or anything like that. There was no other being that he uh, sent his son to die for. He sent his son to die for the human beings that bear his image. They're powerful, they're supernatural, but they still aren't made in the image of God. But Adam also learned that he was so insufficient by himself, so insufficient that God gave him a helper, a helper. And a lot of times people say, women maybe will say, is that all that I am? I'm just a helper, I'm not me myself, I don't have my own identity. Uh, well, that can also come back to the vocabulary that's used, the vocabulary that's used. Um, okay, so here, here's another really good Hebrew word for you to know. Actually, it's not, but, but remember this, ezer kenegdo, okay? So when God created Eve, he said, it's not good for the man to, b to be alone. I'm going to make him an ezer kenegdo, an ezer kenegdo. And what is that? It's a helper suitable for him, okay? H how is that special? There's only one other place or a couple of other places in, in the Bible where God calls somebody an Ezer Konegdo, an Ezer Konegdo. Do you know who that is? That's himself. When he talks about Israel, hi, Israel, I'm your helper. I'm your Ezer Konegdo. I'm there with you. I'm the, I'm the lifesaver for you. That's what I am. And so we think about the mission that God gave Adam and Eve Fill the earth, subdue the earth, put the kibosh on everything. Uh, dominate this world with righteousness. Do evil or do, do battle with the snakes. 
Resist evil. Expand the garden. Make this whole place wonderful, perfect, and productive. That's what I want you to do. The garden is your model. Make the whole world into the garden. He gave Adam quite a daunting task. He really did. And I think, and this is even before sin came into the world. And he said, this man that I have made, he's going to need help. If, he is, if I give him this daunting task, I better give him a tangible, physical helper right there next to him. Because at some point, he's going to want to give up. And I, I, I'll speak in stereotypes for just a moment. But it's a, line, it's a, it's a storyline in a movie that you love. Here's the stereotype. There's a man, and he's got a daunting task. Maybe he's doing battle. Maybe he's building something. Maybe he's, I don't know what he's doing. And he's about to give up. And he's about to throw in the towel. And he's about to say, it's not worth it anymore. And then who comes along? Who comes along? The leading lady. She comes along. And she puts her arm around him. And she gives him a pep talk. And she tells him she believes in him. And guess what he does? He finds the strength to keep going. He finds uh, the motivation. His, all of his desire, all of his drive, all of his passion, all of a sudden comes flooding back. Is that just a helper? Is that just an administ administrative assistant? No. That is the helper that, not that your hands need, not that your mind needs, that's a, the help that your, your soul needs to be bandaged, to be encouraged and to be sent out to do the work again to fight the battle again and that relationship that adam and eve have it's so beautiful look at what he says bone of my bone flesh of my flesh just like me and she will be called woman which means of me part of me she will be called part of me that's really what that means She's part of me. She's somebody that I cannot do without. And the two come together, and they become one flesh. And there's a mystery in that. There's a, even a, a, a spiritual mystery in that. How, how can two things that are totally distinct also come together and be one? And what does that remind you of? It's supposed to remind you, I think, of the Trinity. The Trinity. Here we have God. How many gods are there? Just one God. And so we talk, but we talk about them in, the, in, the, in terms of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're distinct from each other. The, so, the Son is not the Father. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. They're distinct from each other. But are they all God? Yes, absolutely. So how do these multiple things become one thing? It's a, mystery. it's a mystery. It's a mystery. And it's a wonderful mystery. Now, obviously, sin has hurt uh, often the, the, the relationship between Adam and Eve, between husband and wife. And they begin to live in competition with each other. But this is how God created it to be. Does the Trinity live in competition with each other? Absolutely not. Um, the Son comes to earth to exalt the Father. The, the Spirit comes to earth uh, to point everyone towards the Son. And they all lift up the Father. And the Father, what does the Father do back for the Son? He gives him the name above every name. And so in, in, the, in the Trinity, there's this wonderful little, uh, if you want to call it a competition, you can, of who can lift the other up higher. And they're continually lifting each other up, praising each other, lifting each other up higher and higher, not putting each other down. And so in a healthy husband and wife relationship, let's talk about an unhealthy one. In an unhealthy husband and wife relationship, what happens? It happens that the one is trying to get the upper hand. And so we're not lifting each other up. We're trying to put each other down. We're trying to put each other down. We're trying to, uh, and, and, and when you do that, when you put each other down and down and down and down and down and down and down, how, where do you finally end up? In the gutter, right? On the floor, in the dirtiest part of the dirtiest part, if, if you just keep doing that. But if you can change your mindset to being like the Trinity, being like God, saying, how do these two become one? And how do they exalt themselves? How do they get higher and higher? By lifting each other up. And every day looking, looking at your spouse and saying, how in the world am I going to lift this person up today? How am I going to exalt this person today? How am I going to encourage and praise this person today? How am I going to make this person feel praiseworthy today? How do I do that? And if you'll do that, if you'll do that, I think at least for one day, uh, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll have a better home life, okay?
So what does this mean for you and I? If you're a human, remember this. You know, we're all humans here. We're made. We're created. We're not the creator. We're not God. We're created by God. And we're created for a purpose. And we're created with a certain dignity. And we're created uh, for a mission. We have a natural part and we have a supernatural part. And those are supposed to work in concert to help us feel, uh, to help humble us when we need to be humbled and to help us feel better when we need to feel better. When we feel that we have no value, we're supposed to come along and say, hey, guess what? No, I actually do have value because God created me in his image. Secondly, secondly, we're supposed to realize that we have a mission. And our mission is really the same as Adam and Eve's. What is the mission? It is our mandate to take a dangerous and unproductive world and turn it into a little slice of heaven. That's what the Garden of Eden was. It was a little slice of heaven in a, in a world that had thorns and thistles outside the garden, in a place where there was, everything was running wild outside the garden. We expand that garden, make it productive everywhere, create heaven on earth, create heaven on earth. God's given us the model. And so for you and me, what do we do? Every time that I see, um, every time that I see wild chaos, unproductive chaos, everything deteriorating in my home or in my workplace or wherever, what do I do? I say, God help me turn this place into a little slice of heaven. Because don't you want your home to be like that? Don't you want your home to be uh, uh, a little slice of heaven, a sanctuary? The world is tough enough. You want to come home to a place where this is where the kingdom of God is. This is where relationships are right and, and ordered rightly. And this is where everybody's trying to bless each other instead of put each other down. That's what you want. And if to the extent that you, that you can at your workplace, and I don't know where you work, and I don't know what it's like, and I don't know if you're the boss, or I don't know if you're just an employee, and you say, you know what, I, the, this workplace is toxic, okay? We, we hear about toxic workplaces a lot. What's it like at your workplace? And so if it's a toxic workplace, if it's a very bad workplace, if everybody's just backbiting and trying to uh, take advantage of each other and, and get each other fired or whatever to, to, to get the raise or to get the promotion or whatever it is, your mission then, your mission is, is to come in and show everybody how it's done the opposite way. By not being louder, being meaner, being more cutthroat, backstabbing more or putting other people down more. Your job is to come in and, and be the servant and be the servant and turn that place. Uh, you know, when you see somebody struggling, instead of saying, yes, they're struggling, that means I'm going to do better. Instead, you say, can I help you get on the right track? Can I contribute to what you're doing here? and making it the most productive workplace that there is. And when you see a coworker that's having a bad day, you say, can I help you? Can I, I don't know if you're allowed to do this, can I pray with you, okay? Take the chance, can I pray with you? Can I talk to you about what's, what's going on in your life? Can I tell you that I care about you and that and everything's gonna be better and I'm gonna, I'm gonna help you out and let's, let's, let's get back to work and make this a productive workplace. When you see ten, uh, uh, relationships that are strained, can you step in there and say, all right, can I help out here? Can I be a sounding board for anybody uh, to help make this place a better workplace? Can you take your toxic work environment and turn it also into a little slice of heaven that nobody's dreading to come to? I mean, if you've wor ever worked in a place where everybody's dreading to go to work today, can you change that? Can you change that? Same thing in your neighborhood, um, around your neighborhood. What's it like? Is it dangerous or is it um, uh, chaotic or, every, or anything? What can you do to get to know your neighbors, to bring the gospel message, good news, everything that you've got, your redeemed and sanctified heart and your generous love, take it and let Jesus be your example on how to bring a little slice of heaven to every place that you, that you go where it's not very nice to live there. And then also, God told them, fill the earth. Fill the earth with worshipers. Fill the earth with people that know him. And so your children, if you have children, make sure that you're turning them into worshipers. Make sure you're turning them into people who know the Lord and follow the Lord and who are also looking forward to taking that, that, that mandate to live out the mission of God. And if you don't have children, um, then make sure that you are also reproducing yourself in, in people by sharing the gospel with them. And thirdly, Let's go ahead and talk about the fall of man. The snake is still out there, okay? And he sets ambushes for people. 
He wants to entrap them. You'll be tested many, many times about whether or not you'll believe the lie that the snake tells you. Don't believe the snake. Resist evil everywhere you can. Resist the temptation to do it your way and not God's way. Adam and Eve saw God when they opened their eyes for the first time. You didn't. But I hope, for, and, and actually you opened your eyes to a hateful and violent world. But by seeking that encounter with God, your Heavenly Father, and looking fully into the face of Jesus Christ, you will know better who you are and why you're here. So let's go, and let's put the kibosh on evil in our own life and in our home and in our workplace, using as our tool the gospel message, the love of Christ, and our humble, sanctified hearts and minds. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. And we thank you for this encounter that Adam and Eve had with you in the moment of their creation. And we thank you for the wonderful day. And we ask, Lord, that you will help us see that same dignity and walk in that same dignity. Help us to grab onto that mission to bring a little slice of heaven to everywhere on earth where it's just nothing but chaos and pain and hate and, and violence. Help us to be brave enough to do that. Help us to resist temptation, resist the evil one, resist the snake. And help us to see hurting people who need that encounter with you, Lord. Help us to share the gospel with them so that they can have their own encounter with you as well. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Have a good day. See you next week.